Good morning. A lot has happened since I last talked to a camera. I finally got COVID. Well, not finally. That makes it sound like I was like hanging out to get COVID. It finally got to me. Thankfully, it was either just a very mild case of it or just the vaccines worked really well. Probably a bit of both because I just had the most mild symptoms. I got it on Friday, so I spent the weekend in bed and then took Monday off work. But the rest of the week, I uh, worked from home obviously because you have to isolate for seven days and yeah by the end of that week I was pretty much symptom free I just had like the mildest cough so I feel very lucky that that was the case the second kind of major thing that happened is that I quit my job because I have a new job I applied to be a communications person somewhere else I probably shouldn't like mention the actual place on the internet a slight career divergent for me going from being like a journalist at a newspaper to yeah, being a communications person, which is kind of considered the other side of the coin because I'm going to be the one trying to get stories to the media, or at least that will probably be part of my job. I was in my job for seven years, which is crazy to think about. So for anyone who doesn't know, I worked as an advertorial writer for a newspaper, which basically means someone can buy an advert in the newspaper and then they get like a little article alongside with it. So it's advertising, but it has to be written in a way that sounds more like a newspaper article, though obviously anyone reading it would be aware that it is advertising. <laughs> that was what I was hired for anyway. And since then I have worked in like three different offices, different desks throughout those offices. My role like expanded to include all kinds of different other things. And like in the last year, I worked on a whole different team as well. It's such a complicated story, but to kind of try and shorten it, I worked for Community News, which was a community paper, which are like the free papers that you get in your letterbox. And because they're free, obviously the only revenue is from advertising and that revenue just got less and less as the internet became a bigger thing and small businesses realized they could advertise for free on Facebook rather than pay a lot of money to go in a newspaper. So eventually it just wasn't a sustainable business. And in a way we were kind of lucky because the owners of the company could have just cut us right then and there, got rid of the entire papers and just you know, we would have all been made redundant. And they did make a lot of people redundant, but the West Australian, which is the only major newspaper in Western Australia, they already part owned us anyway. And so they decided they would fully own us. And so we moved into their offices and they actually kind of left us alone for a couple of years, which is great. And then pretty much exactly a year ago, they finally decided they were going to do something with us and they rebranded the company. So at that point I was sent basically to an entirely new team because at the West Australian, if you do advertorials, you're considered part of the advertising team rather than the editorial team. Hopefully that all made sense. But anyway, long story short, if I was still with my old team, I would be so sad to be leaving. No offense to my new team, but there's a certain level of trauma bonding that happens with your colleagues when you go through multiple redundancy rounds but even aside from that the people that I worked with at Community News it was a kind of company that just attracted people who 
were there because they enjoyed the job not because they thought it was going to give them any kind of prestige and they were just my kind of people as much as my new team were very nice very welcoming i just don't have the same attachment to them as i do to my old team so leaving even though it was like leaving a job that i've been in for seven years it didn't feel like that at all it kind of felt like i was leaving a job that i'd only been in for one year it kind of felt anticlimactic in a weird way obviously the best thing that i got to do through this job was go see films for free, go to the media screenings. And for a couple of years, I got to write reviews for the paper every single week. I got to interview a bunch of different people. The most famous person I got to interview was Timothy Spall, who's like an amazing British actor, but he's probably most well known for playing Peter Pettigrew in the Harry Potter series. But he was the nicest person. And probably the other most memorable person was Gwilym Lee, who he was in an Australian film and that's what I was interviewing him for but I most knew him for being one of the like detectives in Midsummer Murders so that was really cool I got to tell him how much my family love that show. The other cool person I got to interview was the director Sophie Hyde. They're Australian but they recently directed Good Luck to You Leo Grand which is the film with Emma Thompson that came out recently. I interviewed them for Animals that came out a few years ago with Alia Shawkat and Holiday Granger and even though I didn't really like that film that much it was just so cool talking to them because there were a lot of themes in the film that were very interesting so we had a lot to discuss which was great and that was actually in person which was quite rare. So anyway this is actually my week off I decided I would not immediately start my new job but actually have a week off in between so I should tell you about the books that I've been reading well book that I have finished so I've read Mariana by Monica Dickens this was published in 1940 it's a British novel Monica Dickens is actually like a great great granddaughter of Charles Dickens it covers the life of this girl Mary so it sort of goes from the 20s up until the 40s she's sort of an upper middle class girl in terms of the fact that her father's family are quite wealthy but her mother's family are not her father is dead so her mother works to keep them afloat but on her summer holidays she goes to her rich relatives country home and so she sort of lives a little bit in both worlds. Part of the problem I had with this book I think is that on the back it says that it's very similar to I Capture the Castle and the Pursuit of Love and it's always a risk because obviously it sets up high expectations if those other novels are really good and this just doesn't compare to those novels in terms of the quality of the writing certainly in the style of the story it is similar it is about a girl coming of age in 1930s britain which is what both those books are about as well but both those books are famous because they are so evocatively written because they're so funny because their characters are so memorable and are very timeless characters as well whereas mary i feel like is very much a person of her era and she doesn't quite gel with a modern audience. You get no real sense of sort of independence or intellectual thinking or anything from her. She's also really mean and rude about all the people that she surrounds herself with. And it's interesting to see how the, that style of writing has just not come off well here, whereas it can come off very well in other books. But in this book, it just came across as mean and not funny or entertaining in any way. The author is also clearly thinking that she's giving a lot of characters these interesting eccentricities. It just comes across as quite naff. And something that I found quite common in British books from the 30s is that there is a lot of anti-Semitism and this book is no exception, which is just so uncomfortable to read. It's an interesting snapshot of the time. So in that respect, it wasn't a waste of time reading it or anything, but I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. Definitely, if you're looking for books of a similar ilk, go actually read I Capture the Castle or The Pursuit of Love. I'm currently reading L.A. Woman by Eve Babbitts. I know it's repeatedly said by people who love Eve Babbitts that her non-fiction memoirs or I think they're kind of fictionalized memoirs are better than her novels but my library weirdly has a book about Eve Babbitt's written by someone else but it doesn't have any of her books and I just found this by fluke in an op shop so this is the one I'm going with to try and get on the Eve Babbitt's train. I can definitely see from reading this that a memoir or essay style book would work much better with her writing style. This is a book about a girl called Sophie who is living in LA in the 60s I think it is but it's kind of time jumping a lot because she's constantly talking about other characters and talking about their histories as well as jumping forward into the future. So the timelines are kind of all over the place. You have her parents' story, you have this friend of the family called Lola who she gives a lot of detail about her life. She has stories about her cousins and her aunts and uncles. So all those vignettes are really interesting in themselves but they do feel very disjointed. 
um, and don't feel like a cohesive novel as such. It took me a little while to get into her writing style. It really is very all over the place. There's a lot of repetition as well. The amount of times she said the name Lola when it was unnecessary was starting to get on my nerves a little bit, but I understand it's obviously a style that she's going with. But now I'm more into the book, I am enjoying it. I'm definitely not getting all the references because I really don't know a lot about LA in the 60s or LA at all, I guess. Today's Wednesday, so I'm like halfway through my week off already. People kept asking me what I was going to do and I was just like, nothing like the whole point of it is to not to have to do anything but the one thing i am doing which we booked ages ago but just coincidentally is happening this week is that i'm going to see frozen the musical on stage with my sister which i'm so excited for i haven't seen a big stage musical for so long my sister and i love that film and we weren't even children when it came out i was 18 when frozen came out so i don't even have that excuse i just love it i love that it's about two sisters So Frozen was as amazing as I wanted it to be. It was so much fun. My sister and I were basically like elbowing each other every time like a new character came on stage or there was a new set. They adapted the story really well to the stage and kind of changed a few things that you needed to to make it work for a stage play. But also just the sets were so intricately designed, even if they were only on stage for like 20 minutes or so for one scene. Definitely one of the highlights of my year. So it's been like over three weeks since I started this vlog. I've been doing my new job for three weeks and it's been really good. I'm really enjoying it. Everyone is super nice, which is always a relief. And I'm just doing so much more variety of things and the pace is so different as well. Like it's a much slower pace, which I don't really want to like talk about too much to my new colleagues. Um, but obviously at a newspaper you have like weekly or sometimes daily deadlines. So everything just has to be done super fast. Um, and it's really nice to have more time to be able to do things. So I've obviously been very busy doing that, but I did finish a couple of books. Um, so I finished LA Woman by Eve Babbitts. And I don't think I have too much else to say that I haven't already said in this vlog, but basically I enjoyed bits of it while I was reading it. I enjoyed the atmosphere of it. I think Eve Babbitts has such a unique way of writing and she really evokes a time and a place in a really nice way. But I never felt a huge desire to pick this book back up once I put it down. So I definitely want to read her non-fiction memoir type books because I think her style of writing would work so much better in that form because when you've got a novel with a character that's sort of thinly disguising what is probably quite autobiographical. I sort of felt like the fictionalization of it wasn't really warranted and so I can see why her more memoir style things would work better because they would just read in a more intimate way. I also read Decline and Fall by Evelyn Waugh. I actually bought a whole bunch of his books in these editions on eBay. I already had a couple but they were in such terrible condition that I actually went and bought one of them again and um, I'm still on the lookout for Scoop in a nicer copy than the one that I have. I don't know if anyone else gets this, but I occasionally get the urge to read the entire Wikipedia page of someone, and I did that for Evelyn Waugh recently, and he's a really fascinating person in that I imagine if you met him, he'd come across as just like super grumpy, not particularly nice probably, and certainly with some very varied views, as you expect from an upper class British person from the 20s. But there was a really interesting quote from Nancy Mitford who said that she thought what people didn't understand about Evelyn Waugh is that 
everything he said and did was for a laugh. And so most of his novels are satires, including this one. This is his first novel because I've decided to read the ones that I have in publication order because I always find that really interesting. And he wrote this when he was only about 25, which is very impressive. It's about a young man called Paul Pennyfeather who is at Oxford studying to become a clergyman, I think it is. And um, he gets caught up in some hazing rituals that he was not a part of, but he just happened to be walking in that area at the time ends up without any clothes running down the university and so because he doesn't come from a particularly big named family he is the one who gets chucked out of the university and has to go work at a boys boarding school. This I thought was definitely the most effective part of the novel. You can tell that Evelyn Waugh is really drawing from his own experiences. An interesting fact about Evelyn Waugh is that his older brother got kicked out of quite an exclusive boarding school because he was caught having relations with another boy and Evelyn Waugh was quite annoyed at him for that because it meant that he couldn't go to the exclusive boarding school, he had to go to a different one. We of course know that Evelyn Waugh had gay relationships at university because that's what Brights Avery Visited is based on. On Wikipedia it certainly said that that was like a factual thing, not just a rumoured thing. But anyway, in this book I thought the boarding school part was the most effective, it was the most funny. The book then goes off in another direction in sort of the second and third parts, including Paul ending up in prison, which I thought was the most kind of silly and over the top part. There is an extremely unfortunate section where at the boarding school the boys are doing a sporting day and so their parents will come and watch them do the sports and one of the boys mothers is always bringing with her a new man and she happens to have a black American man with her at this point in time. He himself is betrayed with complete agency and is his own character. Unfortunately the other characters use that n-word to describe him several times which is obviously just super uncomfortable to read and while Evelyn Waugh is clearly using this racist language to demonstrate how awful and racist and snobby these rich people are. It doesn't negate the fact that it's certainly not warranted in this book in any way for him to have used that language. You do obviously have to take into consideration this was published in the 20s when they presumably thought nothing of it. The whole book is written in such a satirical tone that Evelyn Moore doesn't leave any room for sympathy or understanding for any of the characters. You are meant to be considering all of them ludicrous and laughing at all of them them, including Paul himself, a lot of the time. I do wonder what the reaction was when it came out originally, because he completely makes fun of the class structure in Britain, which presumably most of his readers were participating in, including himself. So it's not really a book I would recommend, because I don't think the book's merits outweigh the negative aspect of using that awful language. I'm not about to say we should be censoring old books, because they are a product of their time but we obviously don't have to read all of them now. To finish off the vlog, I thought I would show you some of the books that I have bought recently. So to do that, I will need to take you to the bookshelf. So I don't know if anyone remembers the Royal Diary series. I was obsessed with these when I was a kid. In general, obsessed with historical fiction um, novels in a diary form, but these ones especially because who could resist books like packaged like this with all this gold on the edge of the pages. But these are all diaries about real life princesses and queens throughout history and throughout the world as well which I th always thought was really cool. I already owned like seven of these um, and then I saw most of them all for sale like in a bundle on eBay and I asked the seller if I could just buy the ones that I didn't have already and they very nicely said that that was okay. And then so I only had two left to buy so I ended up finding them separately on eBay incredibly. I'm not sure if I will read these anytime soon but I just love having them. It makes my inner child self so happy to have the complete set because all I ever wanted as a child was to own the complete set of everything. And speaking of historical diaries, I also found a whole bunch of the My Story books on eBay as well. These are the diaries of fictional people set in real historical events throughout Australia's history. And these are also really diverse as well. I don't have all of them, so I don't have like the one of the Chinese child during the gold rush for example. I do have the one of the Aboriginal girl who is part of the Stolen Generation which literally that was this book is where I learned about the Stolen Generation because the Australian curriculum doesn't teach that. I don't know if it does now but it certainly didn't when I was a kid. But yeah I loved these and I honestly 
used these to learn about Australian history um, way more than like reading a history book. And then down here at this little bookshelf, I have some Obshot finds. I have um, The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. And I loved The Age of Innocence um, when I read that a few years ago. So I'm very excited to read this one and I love the cover. And then I found these amazing black penguin um, classics, which I'm obsessed with these insane covers. So there's Christopher Isherwood. Goodbye to Berlin is the book that Cabaret is based on. And then this is another one that I started reading in the op shop and thought sounded really interesting. And this is an Australian classic called The Man Who Loved Children by Christina Stead. And that title is super creepy. I don't know if it's about a pedophile or not, but um, anyway, I will start reading it and find out. And these are actually all owned by the same person. It's got the same name written in it, except I can't read it, so no idea what it was called. But I always wonder when I find classics in op shops which have someone's name written in all of them, like the same name, whether they donated them themselves or whether the person died, because it always kind of makes me a bit sad that this was clearly someone's classics collection. But anyway, they're in my hands now. And then I also bought some Shirley Jackson books brand new. I still have her second memoir that I don't have, but I pretty much have all of them now. Um, these three I've already read and these two I haven't. And I think I might read this one in October because it just looks suitably October-ish. So I will end the vlog there. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're all having a great September. I will see you in my next video. Bye.